But joining me now in the studio is the Conservative MP, David Simmons. Um, David, uh, it is an extraordinary time in politics. Before we get to the position of the Conservative Party, I'd just like a word on what has taken place in the United States of America. Well, good morning, Tom. It's quite shocking to see what's happened. I think we've been very lucky, having just fought an election campaign here in the UK, that we've not seen the kind of incidents that we do see sometimes in American politics. But I think we all wish... Donald Trump and the other people who come forward in that contest the very best because making sure that the leader of the free world is somebody that we can work with is incredibly important. And we want to make sure that it's a contest that's fought in a peaceful way and that gives everybody a chance to have a fair say. Has the leader of the opposition issued a statement? Uh, I'm not aware that we've seen anything from there, but I know many Conservatives have come out and said, look, you know, we wish Donald Trump well. Clearly, we wish President Biden well as well. You know, the United States is a very important ally of the UK and we need to make sure that we have that special relationship, regardless of who the politicians involved are. Now, turning a little bit closer to home, the Conservative Party has its lowest number of MPs in history. Uh, there has never been a time when there have been fewer uh, Conservative voices in Parliament. How on earth does the party build back from this historic low? Well, firstly, we need to show the public that we can be an effective opposition. And the work started on that, making sure that things that the Labour Party put in their manifesto that we said we would oppose, that we're ready to do that work in opposition through the parliamentary processes. But also we need a bit of time to reflect. Now, we know that every successful prime minister, every successful conservative leader has built their own electoral coalition. And Edward Heath's was different from Margaret Thatcher's, which was different from John Major's, from David Cameron's, from Boris Johnson's. So we need to make sure that as we reflect on that, we look at the details of who it was that we lost, who it was that might have supported us if we'd had the right ideas to put forward, and put that electoral coalition together so that we have both a package of policies and the right approach that makes us an electable party to form a government again at the next general election. Now, there's a huge amount of consternation over not only what will be happen in the leadership contest, but what the leadership contest will look like. Will it be under the same rules that have been operating since William Hague was leader of the opposition? Will party members get a say? Uh, and indeed, how long will this take? These are all live discussions within the Conservative Party right now. So there isn't a great deal of consternation, but the, the process for the election of the leader is laid out in the party's constitution. And everybody in the parliamentary party and the voluntary party, as far as I can tell, is committed that that will happen. And that includes members of parliament whittling down the candidates and then the voters, the members of the party, having a chance to choose that person. So you so, believe that the system, as has been in place since the turn of the century, will be the system this time round? That is the, the process that we are planning to use. And we're all very committed to make sure that the volunteers who worked incredibly hard get a say in that process. We also need to make sure that whoever emerges from that as the leader and the policy platform that we have is one that will appeal to something like 14 million voters in the UK, as well as those who are members of the Conservative Party, because that's the sort of number that we need to connect with if we're going to make sure we can form a government at the next general election. Is it, though? Because, of course, the Labour Party has just won an enormous majority on 34% of the vote. Well, it's very clear that the big story of the last election was people staying at home. And we need to make sure that we energise people, that they can see there's a positive agenda that they want to come out and vote for. And that's why that policy platform is going to be so important. The other big factor is going to be the, the sense of the tone of the election, that we know there have been a lot of issues, a lot of division and disagreements within the Conservative Party in recent years. There's a real sense of unity amongst parliamentary colleagues at the moment, a desire to put all of that behind us and make sure that we've got a leader and a policy platform that we can unite around. We do need to take the time to make sure we get that right, that our volunteers and our members and people who support us from the business community, from the academic world, have the chance to critique some of those ideas so we can make sure that what emerges from that is a really strong offer to the voters. So it sounds like you're favouring a much longer election process, a sort of diagnostic process as well as an election process, a, a big battle of ideas over the next four or five months? There's going to be a process certainly running over a number of months, I think, towards the party conference being the conclusion of that in the autumn, because we need to make sure, for example, that we've got all the data about what happened in the election. There are many things that we simply don't know yet about who turned out to vote, where those people turned out to vote, what things there were that influenced people in the way they cast their ballots. And we need to make sure that we get the time to get those decisions right. And one of the risks is that we see a, a knee-jerk response that says, well, the issue is we need to be more like reform or more like Labour or more like the Liberal Democrats. Mm. We need to win voters from all of those parties 
if we're going to form that successful electoral And coalition. yet you mentioned these parties. The Liberal Democrats have more members of Parliament than at any point in that party's history. Uh, they've got over 70 MPs now. They rival the Conservatives in terms of size in, in Parliament. And also reform. Now five MPs, a real bridgehead, a real foothold in Parliament, and millions of votes, more votes than the Liberal Democrats in the country. Is there not a risk to the Conservative Party that if there's a very long leadership election, there's a vacuum in the opposition? And that vacuum is stepped into by Sir Ed Davey and Mr Nigel Farage. Well, it's pretty clear Ed Davey doesn't really have very much useful to say on anything. And it's going to be a very strange parliament because we know as well as the reform members of parliament, you've got the, the Gaza candidates as well, who are going to be a big issue for the way that the Labour government conducts itself. But I think it is worth taking the time to get this right. We know that we're in for a period of opposition. The Labour Party has a very big majority. There are things that we promised our voters that we would oppose, and we need to make sure that we do that. And I know that Rishi Sunak is absolutely committed that he will lead that opposition effectively in the time that he remains as the leader. And that gives the rest of the party, the volunteers, our supporters in the wider country, the opportunity to make sure that we do properly learn the lessons of what happened a few weeks ago and that we come out of that strong and ready to fight the next election as an effective, credible governing party. Do you believe that Rishi Sunak would be willing, therefore, to serve as leader of the opposition for many more months to come, having humiliating exchanges over the dispatch boxes at Prime Minister's Questions with the new Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer? A lot of people are very sceptical that Rishi Sunak would want to stand there as the sort of leader of a defeated party, week after week after week, still standing at that dispatch box, still asking those questions. Well, public service isn't easy and tough decisions are not just things for government. We have to take them in opposition as well. But Rishi has been very clear that he will serve in that capacity to make sure the party has the time and the space that it needs to make the right decision about his successor and that we have that effective opposition laid out in the next few months. And given that we're likely to make a decision around about the time of party conference, maybe just after, in the early autumn, it means that we go into the new legislative period of the, the forthcoming parliament, the debates that will follow about the legislation outlined in this week's King's speech, as a party that is absolutely fit to oppose, mm. but also to begin mm. to set out what our alternative legislative agenda would be, because we want to make sure that the voters can see what the choice is before them. Mm. Now, just finally, there are some names that have been floating around, none of them officially declared yet, of course, but Kemi Badenoch, Robert Jenrick, Suella Braverman, Tom Tugendhat, James Cleverley. Are you leaning towards any of them? Well, the party is full of talent. I think amongst those names, there are people like Tom, whose politics are very much uh, politics that I find a great affinity with. We need to give them the opportunity to show to our volunteers, to our party members, to members of parliament and to the wider public that they've got the ability not just to develop good policies, but to communicate those effectively in a way that the voters will warm to. So I think this is an opportunity for all of them to do that and all of us, regardless of the outcome, to get behind the leader that emerges. Keeping your cards close to your chest. David Simmons, thank you very much for joining us uh, this, uh, this morning. Really, really appreciate it.